Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. People are still coming in, so we will um, uh, welcome them as they come in, but we like to get started on time. We ask you please to uh, close off your video. It helps a lot with the streaming and uh, keep your microphones muted. We'll have a time for you to ask questions a little later on. But we want to welcome Representative Celeste Davis with us this morning. She is going to be sharing with us uh, some thoughts about where we are in education and what things are going to look like in 2021. As with everyone, we're doing a lot of speculating right now, so we won't hold her to that, but we do appreciate so much her spending time with us today. This is being brought to you by STEM Center South Carolina. STEM Center South Carolina is a statewide network that works with K through 12 schools to bring you advanced STEM opportunities and in instruction initiatives in your district and around the state. So welcome Representative Davis. Thank Thank you so much. Would you like to give a welcome yourself? Thank you. Yes, I would. Um, just by way of introduction, for those of you who do not know me, um, the reason I'm so interested in STEM education, number one, I, I have always been um, a public education advocate. I always loved school growing up. Um, I had children of my own in the public school system. Um, I probably have some teachers that were tired of seeing me because I was always in the classroom um, starting out in first grade. I was um, volunteering to read with children during my lunchtime. Um, I was working full time and um, teaching junior achievement classes and being involved in PTOs and um, the School Improvement Council. At one point I was um, on the board at the South Carolina School Improvement Council and served as the chair of that board for a year. Um, so, you know, I've been in education and around education for a very long time. And um, I've always had an interest in STEM. Um, in fact, um, one of, I'll, I'll like to tell the story that one of my most incriminating uh, high school photos was a picture of me with the math club. And I'm front and center, just smiling like crazy because I, I love that. So I ended up majoring in math, had a degree um, in, in math and, and computer and information technology, and then went on to, um, to work in the IT field um, for an electric utility for, for 20 years. So. This is my love, and um, so by the you know when I was first um, elected to the legislature, I took on this STEM education issue as just a, an issue that was important to me and one that I wanted to advocate for. So, um, so that's why I'm here. And you know, anytime you ask me, I, I will always um, come and and talk and um, and be available to you. Thank you, Representative Davis. We at STEM Center South Carolina know your dedication to education. And uh, uh, if you are online, you may not know that Representative Davis is the driving force behind the STEM Day at the Capitol. It was because of her desire that that even came into being. So we do appreciate your dedication. I'm gonna go ahead uh, with the questions. As you registered, some of you submitted questions and this first one is pretty all encompassing of um, many of the questions that were submitted. It's rather lengthy, but I'm gonna go ahead and read it and then let Representative Davis uh, answer with uh, what she wants to share with us. Describe what our leaders have learned about learning and teaching in the midst of a pandemic and how was that driving decision concerning the education environment? How will we provide and maintain safe environments for learning and teaching? What efforts are being made to help provide equal and equitable learning opportunities for students, families, and educators as we consider this moment in time a revealing opportunity, a potential for turning point in the endeavor of education? So that, that is a loaded question, and there's a lot of good discussion in there in, in, in all of that. So I'll just start with the very beginning and um, and what what leaders have learned about learning and teaching in the midst of a pandemic. And I think that that what we've learned is is still to come, right? Um, yeah, but I think that what we have learned are some things like online instruction is important. Um, mental health is important. Um, 
valuing our teachers and our parents and having our parents engaged and our families engaged in education is important. Um, good information is important. I, you know, so I think that what we've learned encompasses all of that. Now, as far as um, really learning in the sense of having the, the data that goes with that, with those, um, you know, sort of overarching lessons learned, I, th I think we, that's still to be learned. Um, I think that once we get our children back together in a, um, you know, in somewhat traditional um, education session, we will really start to understand at that point what they've learned and what they've grasped and what they've understood um, as far as online learning. I was just reading something yesterday, I think, uh, it was a concern about um, children that are in kindergarten that are just learning to read. And how do you teach a child to read online? I, you know, I don't, I don't know a, a, if that it can be done or not. And I think that that's, that we, um, that we will still see whether that can actually be done or not. I mean, I always taught my children to read by sitting with them and and reading with them and, and pointing out words and you know it was um it's a very hands-on activity so i think that there's a lot of that that is still yet to be to be known um, um and how is that driving decisions well i think that there again once we figure out kind of where we are and, and what we really have learned i think that that will drive decisions it should drive, drive decisions going forward um, how we can how can we provide and maintain safe environments now um, I will say a few weeks ago the governor created um, a task force called accelerate SC and there are a number of different um, categories or, or, or different um, approaches um, different areas of concern as far as getting us growing again I, I like to say we need to get South Carolina growing again because we were growing we had record unemployment and so now we're seeing uh, you know I don't even know today what the unemployment name numbers are they have started tapering off which is a good thing um, but so, so um, the governor put together a task force they're looking at a number of different issues one of the issues obviously is what do we do um, as far as education and um, Molly Spearman has put together her team accelerate ed and if you guys have not looked at that, um, you can go to the South Carolina Department of Ed website and um, go into the COVID-19 response. And you can see the um, recordings and the meeting minutes from the Accelerate Ed Task Force. And that's where they're really talking about, um, you know, the details on um, what that response is going to look like. Um, how do you bus children to school when you've got to observe um, social distancing? How do you clean the buses, clean the classrooms? Um, how do you um, provide mental health services? Because I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I mean, you know, I, I consider myself to be mentally healthy, but you know, being stuck inside for long periods of time is tough. And, 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 you know, not being able to do the things that we've always done and be with our friends and, and in some cases being with our families even. That, that's tough and it's tough on people. So I think we're going to have the whole mental health issue um, to deal with at the same time. Um, this question also touches on providing equal and equitable um, learning opportunities. Um, you know, I think we've got the issues of um, students that don't have access to broadband. And luckily, I'm hearing a lot of discussion about the, um, the recognition that we need more broadband access, particularly in the rural areas of South Carolina. Now, I will say that Google has stepped up to the plate, and in, um, in the low country area, at least, they are providing um, mobile hotspots where they take buses that are not being used right now and they provide them with um, you know, internet access and they can place these buses in these remote areas um, you know, based on a certain schedule and then students, assuming that they have the, you know, the laptop or, or whatever they need, um, 
they, they are able to use that hotspot to gain access to the internet. So I think that is a very important issue when we talk about equal and equitable learning opportunities. Now, the other issue I believe is special education and dealing with those students that need specialized instruction, um, a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, um, care and um, teaching by someone that is um, that that has the education and the experience to deal with those sorts of issues. So I do think that we will find that there are some disparities. Um, from what I'm also hearing, and you guys I'm sure have a lot more information on this than I do, but there are some students that we haven't heard from. Um, so we've got students out there that may not have access to the internet. They you know, they, they may not have access to someone there at home that's actually trying to work with them. So I think that there again, once we all get back together, we'll start sorting out some of those issues that um, unfortunately for some of these students may end up being long term issues. Um, so we're going to have to deal with that when we get to it. Um, and let's see. Yeah, well, I, th I think that that probably took care of question one. If there's anything that I missed, let me know. <laughs> you were extremely informative and that that was a full question so thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your knowledge with us on that one uh we uh have another question we want to look at and you touched a little bit on this but maybe you have something else to share how will the state be supporting districts schools and families when we plan to reopen the school in the future well, it looks to me that the plan is um, to appropriate money. Um, so the support, I think, will, will come in terms of, of money and guidelines. It looks like the Accelerate Ed group that um, um, Molly Spearman is heading up, of course, it looks like that group will be coming up with the guidelines. But they do recognize that not all districts will be the same. And not all districts, um, um, you know, will be able to handle the things, things in the same manner. So I think that the school will, rep, um, will supply um, dollars and guidelines, but it, then it's going to be up to the individual districts and possibly even up to the individual school. Um, and that's what I would recommend, um, that they handle it you know, in a manner that's best for their community and their school and their teachers. Um, because as we know, we, you know, every school, every district, every teacher is different. Um, every classroom is different. Every child is different. Um, so I, I think that that's where you're going to see the, the state supporting. As we go into this last question that we've chosen for today, Representative Davis has asked to hear from you. So if you have questions or suggestions that you would like to share with her, please put those in the chat box. We will be sharing those with her. If we have time, we'll get to some of them today. But as we talk about this last question, uh, I wanted to give you the opportunity to put some of your thoughts or questions in the chat box. So the third question we're going to talk about today is, what can we expect to be different for next year? Number of students in classes, a number of hours of learning, just what have you heard or what can you provide, information can you provide us for next year? Well, um, I, am, I am hearing, and one thing that the legislature um, specifically placed in the continuing resolution um, um, legislation that we just voted on and the governor just um, signed into law was the ability for schools to, to sort of ramp up their summer school um, ability and, and maybe even some um, instructional bridge work um, and, and when I say instructional bridge work I mean for those students that necessarily didn't weren't able to keep up um, via the online instruction it, it provides them additional support over the summer so that if and when we open the schools as normal in the fall which I you know I'm crossing my fingers that we can get to that point because I think that's where we need to be um, that those students aren't so far behind um, because that's going to put a strain on 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 everybody it'll put a strain on those students on the other students on the teachers on the administrators um, so I, I think I think you'll see um, 
some of that over the summer. Um, as far as number of students in classes, I mean, what I'm hearing until we have a vaccine, and, and I think that that's still um, possibly a year to 18 months out, unfortunately, but until we have a vaccine, I think you're gonna see this continuing effort um, to, to implement social distancing and you know hand washing and sanitizing and maybe mask maybe not mask you know I, I'm hearing um, you know discussion and opinions on both sides of that issue now um, to try to keep children away from each other or to get children to wear a mask I think that that um, you know I, I just don't think that can happen um, and I don't think we should expect that to happen. Um, I, we, I don't think that, that we even want, want to do that. So anyway, um, you know, I, I think that this, the decisions that will be made from the governor's office and from Molly's office, I think those decisions will be based on healthcare data and scientific data. And so to that extent, I think that we'll just do what the data dictates that we do. Um, you know, I, I do want to talk at some point about where I think that we this can take us because I do think that there are a lot of lessons learned during the course of this pandemic and during the course of um, us being apart and having to to um, yeah be creative in our learning. Um, I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned there, and and I would love to hear from others about where you think this leads us you know, what's the next big step in education? And, you know, we've talked for the last two years in, in the legislature and, and amongst our, our educators about what we need to reform education in South Carolina. And I think that right now we have a golden opportunity to do that reform and implement what's needed. Um, so I do think, you know, if there's a silver lining in, in all of this, and I do think that there are some silver linings, um, I think that it is, that we've learned a lot and we can learn a lot and i think we're right for reform uh that just came perfectly as dr tom peters put in the chat box the plus side of an emergency of this magnitude is that it allows us an opportunity to rethink things we took for granted as givens mm -hmm. what things or do we what things ought we rethink about school as we currently know it? And I think that question may be going out to everyone that's in the chat along with you, Representative Davis. And please go ahead and share with us the thoughts that you wanted to share that weren't the questions we had. Um, as we have things that are coming in the chat box, we'll share those with you too. Well, I mean, I think what we some of the things we've learned is, of course, online learning is um, I think going forward going to be another tool in the toolbox. And I think that it, it's what we may find, and, then, and there again, I think we'd have to look at the results and, and look at how well this, this actually worked for us. But I think that we'll find that some students um, perform better and maybe some students perform not as well just because as we all know everyone has different personalities I mean, you've got introverts and extroverts um, at the very basic and, um, and 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 you've got different learning styles um, and different interests and so um, you know I think we're gonna find that we are going to be able to implement more online learning maybe more flexible learning um, more ability to allow those students, um, for example, get um, the students in gifted and talented, maybe give them some assignments that they do at home and expands their, um, you know, their knowledge of a specific subject or something, a specific topic. Um, so I think that it provides us a way to engage more students. Because right now, I mean, that's our students are online. And whereas, you know, I grew up sitting in a desk in a classroom in a row, and I always had to sit at the front because otherwise I'd be distracted by what was going on around me. But, you know, that's what we grew up in that sort of, um, you know, traditional classroom setting. You know, I, th I don't think our students are, are thinking that way anymore. So um, I think that online learning will. Um, definitely play a huge role going into the future and I think once we bring these students back in to a classroom I you know I think that the, the classroom's going to look different too um, 
and 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 I would really love to hear the the teachers perspective on online learning and and how that that worked um, you know um, I've always had this this idea that at some point we will be able to have classes where we bring students together and we use technology to actually bring in other students and other classes. Um, and those classes could be um, a, from California or Alaska or Antarctica or, um, uh, or France or Italy or Russia or China, um, you know, to, to sort of expand the learning experience to um, more of a, a national or maybe even a global learning experience. So, um, and, and I think that our students are ready for that. Um, I, I find that our students are culturally diverse and they're interested in other cultures. They're interested in um, what's going on in other areas of the world. So I think that, that we take advantage of that. Um, I also, as, as we talked earlier, I think that broadband access is key to that. And I think that as a, as a state, in state government and, and federal government, we need to be looking at broadband access as an infrastructure issue. Um, it's just like roads and bridges and electricity and water. Um, broadband access has, has just become a necessity. And so we need to treat it as such. And that means, you know, having specific goals and having the, the funding that goes with that, federal funding and the state funding. And I think we're gonna see that, I really do. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing it talked about you know, at all levels of government, which is, which is great. Um, I also think that we're going to see more public-private partnerships. I've seen schools, especially the feeding programs, I'm here in Berkeley County, the Berkeley County School District has joined forces with a local church that was very interested in being involved in the distribution of food. And I think that that partnership has worked really well. Um, the, the partnership that I mentioned earlier with Google, um, you know, those partnerships um, are ripe for the taking and um, there are entities that want to be involved. And I think that, you know, as we look forward and talk about, you know, what the future looks like and what our opportunities for the future looks like, I think that we, if we're smart, we involve all of those public private partnerships and we figure out how we do this uh, collectively. Thank you for that good word. That collectively is extremely important. The questions are pouring in and let me assure you uh, folks that are in the chat, we will get all of these to Representative Davis and if you have ones that you think of after with the chat, we'll make sure she gets those too. But here's one that I think concerns all of us uh, from Angela Tanner. Are you looking at waiving state assessments for next year as well as we try to recover from this year? Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely, definitely. There are some, um, and I was looking back at the, um, the continuing resolution legislation. We, we've put in, in law, um, in, the, in the legislation, some abilities to suspend, suspend some of that, those assessment tests. Um, and I think that, I think that we will see, I think we'll see definitely that going forward. Um, but there again, I, I, I really believe that we need feedback from our teachers on you know the extent of that and what that needs to look like because um, you know our, our teachers our educators are on the front lines if you will and so um, that feedback is extremely important um, in making these decisions going forward and we have um, let me go back to this room what are we doing to help and support parents if we have to go on a modified school schedule, but both parents work, extended days are closed and people are struggling with options. That's right. Well, um, as, of, as of right now, well, when the pandemic first started, you know, we had um, those workers that were classified um, essential. And so we allowed for some help for those um, you know, those parents that, that had to work and were deemed essential. Well, um, you know, everybody's essential. Everybody's essential in a working economy. And I think we're figuring that out very quickly. So um, when we, when everyone does go back to work, I think you are going to see, 
see an issue there. And I think it's just something that we're going to have to work through. And I think that I believe that the state's going to have to help with that um, in, in terms of funding or um, some sort of assistance. And here's another thing that the state may need to think about. The online learning needs to be defined. Yes. There was a difference among districts and schools. Some were actually teaching new material while others were reviewing and reinforcing things that were learned prior to COVID-19. Right. So that, that's something to think about also. Yes. Yes. And, and we all have a concern about those students that we're not reaching, that even through continuous emails and phone calls and even visits to homes. I know some teachers are, are going to homes of students they haven't heard from. Some of our students are not receiving the same education as others. Are we able to, um, to find those students um, when, when we do home visits? Are we even able to find them during home visits or? Uh, do you have do you have any knowledge of that or any feedback on that? Um, Angela Tanner, if you don't mind unmuting, can you answer that? I know you've been really uh, working on that with your school district. Angela's from the Coastal PD area. Okay. We have some students who have totally um, disappeared. We've gone to the neighbor's house. We've contacted you know anybody on their contact list. Okay, please help us. And they're like, oh, we'll try to get in touch with them, but they are just they are just gone. And I can just tell you from, um, you know, I'm in a Title I school. Our community is free and reduced lunch. My parents are done, D-O-N-E, with virtual learning. They're yeah. like, I can't do this anymore. Um, so we, we, are, we are struggling to maintain that, you know, for the first few weeks, they were kind of on board, but it's just like, I can't do this anymore. And I under, you know, I, Fortunately for me, my children are grown. If I had to be a virtual principal and still teach my own children, I'd be nuts. Um, but yeah, we've had some folks that have just, I mean, it's like in, just disappeared. Well, that's, um, you know, that's obviously very concerning. Um, and it makes me wonder, do we have incorrect addresses for them? Um, or, or have they had to, to leave? Um, you know, it, I mean, it's concerning for me that, um, you know, just the thought of children being left at home, potentially alone, um, really, I, you know, I, I have a hard time sleeping thinking that stuff like that may and probably is going on. So we're going to have to, I mean, we're going to have to have a concerted effort to try to find these children and get them back and the, get them back in the classroom. Um. And, and, you know, I've, I've heard there are a lot of parents that are done. I, I can totally understand that. I, I remember at, at one point my son went through a phase where he wanted me to homeschool him. And, you know, I thought, you know, no, there's no way I can teach every subject and be as effective as, as an educator. Um, you know, I didn't have the background and, you know, I, I just, I knew that that, that was not going to work. So, um, right now, you know, we, these parents have had a lot placed on them, especially those that are trying to work from home and educate their children. So they're, they're ready to get their children back to school. I think the children are back getting ready to get back to school. Um, the, the issue that we're going to have, I, I think, is, is just numbers. It's going to be a numbers issue and trying to figure that out. And we are coming up to the end of our 30 minutes. This time goes very quickly. We have on, on the chat with us today, Tracy Elmore, who is the State STEM Teacher of the Year. Tracy, you put something in the chat box. Would you like to comment on that? Um, I'm just agreeing with everybody. Um, you know, I've tried to email and call and you know, try to get these students to complete my work. And it's like what um, Amy Baldwin was saying that our, I don't know if this is for every district, but our district has gone with related arts classes as doing like collected, missing or incomplete for related arts. So for the a nine week, a quarter class. And so they're not even receiving grades. So a lot of the parents are like, mm, it doesn't matter because they're not getting a grade. So, you know, I'm struggling in that part. And then I, 
you know, talk to parents on the phone and they're like, yeah, I'll get them to do it. But then there's nothing, you know, and I just feel helpless sometimes. Um, I try to do little Google meet meetings and offer like Chick-fil-A gift cards, Chick-fil-A cookies, things like that to try to get the kids involved and engaged. And it's the same ones, you know, that you normally get. So I just struggle and worry about the achievement gap with the students because I feel like, I'm not reaching them as well as I could if we were in the classroom um, face to face. Um, this has been a struggle for everyone, for, of course. And of course, you know, grace over grades, and we've got to, um, you know, be patient and understanding and flexible. And um, I just worry about my students. You know, I just want them to achieve and be successful. And that's all. Yeah, I, I, I totally understand that. You know, I think, and I was just reading this, this is not a South Carolina problem. This is a United States problem, and I, I even venture to say it's, it's a worldwide issue. It really concerns me that, um, you know, we've got a whole generation of children, basically, that um, are missing instruction. And... Um, you know, I, th I think that that there again, once we are able to get back together, we're really going to have to figure that out and figure out how how far behind they may or may not be. Um, but it, it really it really concerns me. Mm -hmm. Well, folks, our time is up. Again, that 30 minutes goes very fast. If you would like to join us at four o'clock and you did not register, please go back and do that. We'd love to have you at four o'clock, but you cannot get in unless you've registered. Representative Davis, you have just been delightful today. We so appreciate you being with us. And as we are closing off, I ask uh, STEM Center staff and Representative Davis to stay on the line. The rest of you have a good day. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.